as we continue in worship this morning, on the screen it simply says, reach, teach, and serve. It's our purpose as a church. We reach out to those who are in need of the gospel with the truth of the scriptures. Uh, we look for every opportunity to teach all the ways of His Word. And of course, as uh, baptized believers, doesn't it make sense that we would look for every opportunity to serve our Savior? Let's pray as we continue this morning. Dear Lord God, we are thankful as a church, as a people, called by your name, that we are privileged to be a part of your work, that we are able to serve our living, loving Savior. Father, as we continue uh, through this time, the desire is that we would identify your truth, apply it in our lives, and allow you to speak through us as we walk through the world that you've blessed us to be a part of. You're an amazing God. You're an awesome God. We thank you for all that you have done, what you are doing, and what you are going to do. In the name of our Savior, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Our title today is The Last Supper. Uh, I know oftentimes for myself, I feel like that Last Supper was way too far away. Uh, I know yesterday at lunch, I had tri-tip. I had, I had a really delicious hot link, too. It was, it was, it was a hot link. But it wasn't like it peeled 18 layers off your tongue when you ate it. I like that. It's a good, that's a hot link. Uh, I know someone had commented to the group that their hot link was too hot. It's a hot link. Right? Uh, and I know that's not what we're talking about today. Uh, our series that we've been in, uh, we're just looking at some, many of the things that took place um, during this uh, week, uh, the Passion Week as it's referred to, uh, leading up to the crucifixion and of course... Uh, the resurrection of our Savior Jesus. And uh, in today's uh, message, we'll be looking in the book of uh, Luke 22. It's appropriate that it falls on the first Sunday of the month, in that we are also take, sharing in the Lord's Supper later on today. Uh, Lord's Supper is one of those things that we do to remember uh, the great sacrifice that Jesus made for us in the giving of His body on the cross and the shedding of His blood. Uh, and the reality is, when it comes to Old Testament and when it comes to the law, um, there's only one payment for sin. And I believe it's a blood payment. When we read in the book of Romans, uh, we're reminded in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, thankfully, it doesn't end there. Uh, it, scripture continues on. Well, I should say uh, it gets a little gloomier. Uh, another, another passage that fits in so nicely says that the wages of sin is death. Now that's where I should say, thankfully it doesn't end there, right? You guys, you need to keep me on my toes, okay? You just let me walk through that. You didn't say a thing. So you think about it. If, if everyone has sinned, and I'm going to raise my hand. My mom is right there. My mom can, can verify this story. Growing up, I was a pretty good kid. I did not get in much trouble, and I also chose to sin. That's the truth, right? And I don't raise your hand. I know that every one of us, if I were to ask, you know, no, not you. Kool-Aid, Kool-Aid. <laughs> I can't look at Kool-Aid the same, man. I wouldn't eat my liver one night, and my dad's like, eat that liver, boy, and out comes the Kool-Aid. It got all over me. The red is just bleeding down the wall. And I'm like 30 years old, and I'm like, Dad, I don't like that liver. <laughs> and then later on when I'm telling this story, he said, boy, I thought you were like eight, and it was green beans. <laughs> Now, in reality, I know that's a complete turn on the subject. That is a story that I have shared with students over the years because I'm blessed to have been raised in a Christian household with parents that loved uh, my brothers and I. They weren't perfect, and they never claimed to be, but they did the best they could in God's name. Uh, and, and I would share with my students that that was my abuse story. <laughs> Because I was disobedient and wouldn't eat the dinner that my mother had placed in front of us, uh, which is understandable, right? Uh, and keep in mind, though, at times I was talking with students that had, well, without being graphic, let's just say that they had experienced much, 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 much worse than I could ever even imagine. Is that a good way to put it? And I'll just say, and I know this is a detachment from where we're going today, I'm just going to say, thank you, Jesus. 
right? Because that's a blessing. Here we are. We're back to what we were talking about. For all of sin and for, fall short of the glory of God, you get it. And if I were to ask you to raise your hand if you've ever sinned, you don't have to, right? I'm not asking you to do this. I'm just saying if, right? If. If I, if all of us, if we were honest, all of us could raise our hands. Because we've, we've all done something. And if we didn't raise our hand, then we'd need to raise our hand because we weren't being honest. You get it, right? It's just the reality of the world we live in. Uh, you know, we want to blame Eve for it, but I blame Adam just as much, if not more, uh, because, you know, God places him in the garden. It's the best, most beautiful place, right? And he gave him one rule, one rule. He says, don't eat from the the tree in the center of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the serpent, you know the story, tempts Eve, and she's like, yeah, I'll have some of that. And then what does she do? She goes and shares it with Adam, and he's like, yeah, baby, that's good, I'm going to have some of that too. And they release sin into the world. Uh, I always wonder, what would have happened if when Eve comes cruising out of the garden, wherever she was at, with whatever that fruit was from the tree they're not supposed to eat from, if, if Adam would have said, whoa, we can't eat that. Get rid of that. No, I will not eat that. I wonder, even if he had failed there, even if he had failed there, if when God showed up walking through the garden, instead of hiding uh, his, his, naked, his nudity behind fig leaves and hiding from, think about it, hiding from the all-seeing, all-knowing God behind a bush, right? I've always wondered, man, how would it have been different instead of hiding behind the bush, and instead of blaming God and blaming Eve for Adam's choice to eat from the fruit, I've always wondered, man, what would it be like? Would it be different? I don't know. You have to ask God when you see Him, right? But uh, here's the thing. We live in a world that has sin in it. And we suffer the consequences of that sin. And the reality is, oftentimes, we even suffer the consequences of the sin of others. Does that make sense? Uh, I had a friend one time, this is his little joke thing he saw. He said that one time there was a gentleman walking through a, a building, in the, a room in the church, and there was a bunch of folks gathered, and they were gossiping about the town drunk. Uh, it's actually, oh, since the relatives are here, uh, it was Ron Clymer's story, but you know, he stole it from somebody too. Uh, but he says, they're wa he's walking through the room, he hears they're gossiping about the town drunk, you know, or whatever, this one person. And you can substitute whatever you want for town drunk. And anyway, you know, and then he comes back a little bit later, they're still talking about the same dirt person. And as they're walking by, one of them says, Pastor, did you hear what I heard about such and such and so and so? And he said, you know, I did, several times, just recently. And he says, I'm so thankful that my sin is different from their sin. Now think about it. Sin is sin. Now, I know the reality. Some sins have different earthly consequences here. But man, when it comes down to it and rubber hitting the road, right? Sin is sin. And when we read the scriptures in Romans, it says the wages of sin is death. And oh, I'm finally back to it. I am so thankful that this story doesn't end there. Because thankfully, we serve a God who has compassion on His creation he saw that we are a people who need a Savior. And He sent His own Son to pay the price for my sin and for yours. That's what we say. Amen. It's appropriate, isn't it, right there? Man, that is huge, right? Think about it. If uh, uh, I think of mortgage debt. That's something that's pretty big, right? Think about it. If just out of nowhere... Somebody that you'd never even met before paid your mortgage, paid off your car debt, paid off your credit card debts, just out of nowhere, just paid them off, right? I'm going to tell you that that gift, that blessing, pales in comparison to the price that Jesus paid for our sin. Amen. So we're going to get into Luke 22. I'm just, you know, setting the stage for you right there. Uh, so we would identify, man, just how important, how important Jesus is to our everyday walk. Um, I was talking with someone recently. They dealt with uh, a loss in their family, a great loss. And, and I, I told them, that I, I don't know how people that don't know Christ, I, I don't know how they survive this kind of loss. I, I don't know how they survive in this world. And, and I know it's easy to be critical of others, but think about it. 
As a Christian, man, we have the Holy Spirit in us. We have Jesus carrying us, if you will, through whatever it is that happens. Well, when we let Him, right? Uh, and man, these other folks that oftentimes we look down on, the reality is they're out there on their own. They're out there on their own just doing the best that they can in a frightening, scary world. And the reality is, instead of looking down on them, right? When we're the ones with the truth of Jesus Christ, man, we can show them some love. This is uh, Luke chapter 22. And we're going to go ahead and start at uh, verse 1. It says this, Now the feast of unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus. For they were afraid of the people. I have to stop just so you, you can catch the idea. These chief priests, the ones they're describing, Jesus is cutting against the grain. Okay? They're saying one thing and he's saying something else. And at times he's pointing out their hypocrisy. Now you know none of us like our hypocrisy to be pointed out. Uh, we generally aren't very excited about having our uh, mistakes pointed out either, right? right. Uh, but here's the thing. They've, they've decided, man, we're down with this guy. We don't like him. We want to get rid of him. Uh, several times they've tried to grab him, arrest him, uh, attack him, uh, but his time had not yet come. And believe it or not, this uh, gentleman who was born flesh and bone and is also a man and is also supernatural God did not allow them. Uh, scripture usually says that he simply left, or he simply did not. It doesn't say specifically what take. I, I don't know, man. Maybe he just like, poof, and he disappeared and appeared somewhere else. I mean, this stuff happens, right? He's able to do things that I can't do. But here's the reality. It's getting close to his time, uh, the time when he says that uh, he must be glorified. The, the glorification comes through the cross and the resurrection, right? Amen. Uh, that, that's what he's here for. Uh, just a simple reality. It's not simple, is it? It is complex, and, and it is deep, and it is busy. They don't want to just arrest him at any place, at any time. Because everywhere at this point of his ministry, pretty much everywhere Jesus goes, a crowd shows up. Amen. Because there are people who have, and you meet them today too, open hearts, and open minds, open hearts and open minds that are open and searching for His truth. And their craving is Jesus. And that, that's the crowd, man, that's following Him around. And these, the chief priests, they were a little bit leery, right? They didn't want to just go in amongst the crowd. It could have been a thousand plus, right? Um, what was it with the feeding of the, the 5,000? Think about it. You want to walk into the middle of this crowd that's been listening to Jesus' teachings that are amazing and miraculous, that carry more depth than anything they've ever heard before in their entire life, and he just broke up a handful of fish and bread and fed the whole crew. The 5,000, man, that doesn't include women and children that may have been present, right? You don't just want to walk in the middle of that crowd and throw the cuffs on the guy and drag him out, right? Their fear was that that same crowd would rally to his aid and crush them while rescuing him. That's what verse 3 is get, letting you know. Because sometimes we wonder, and we see this uh, in our, our culture today in our society, well, why doesn't someone arrest that guy? Sometimes it could be that they're waiting for the safer time and the safer opportunity to do so to protect us. Does that make sense? Craziness, right? Verse 3. Then, listen closely. Helps you understand Ju Judas' motives, right? Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when, listen closely, no crowd was present. Now we can uh, grieve him all we want, but the reality is Jesus came here to be the sacrifice 
for the sin of humanity. Amen. That was his purpose. That's why he was born of a virgin. That's why he walked this earth tempted in every way and chose never to sin. Amen. Because he came here to be the perfect blood sacrifice for the sin of humanity. Amen. He is obedient to the Father. He is obedient to the Word. And He loves you dearly. Amen. Kind of interesting, right? Some of you have been in a place where you were hiring folks to do work for you or for a company that you work for. How many of you would be excited to hire and say, hey, I want to hire this guy because I'm pretty sure he's going to sell me out and get me fired. Right? Yeah. No. And Daryl's sitting back there. You've hired a bunch of folks over the years, haven't you? The Daryl next to you have as, has as well. We have fired a bunch of them too. Uh, but here's the thing. We don't want to hire someone that we know is going to betray us. We don't want to hire some, someone that we know is intentionally going to do a terrible job and even jeopardize our life. Right? Don't you know that Jesus knew exactly who Jesus, Judas, excuse me, Judas was when he called him to be one of the twelve? Don't you know Jesus knew exactly what Judas was going to do? Amen. Someone had to be trained. Right? right? Someone had to lead us, take us, and provide these different opportunities. But here we are. Jesus is there. Judas is one of the twelve. He struck a deal with the high priest to sell Jesus out. And specifically, when there wasn't a big crowd around to uh, rally to his aid. As if Jesus needs a big crowd to rally to his aid. Think about it. He allows himself to be arrested. Amen. He allows himself to be put on trial. He allows Himself to be placed on that cross. And He gave His life on the cross. <clears throat> because He is that perfect sacrifice. Scripture continues, verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying... Go and make preparation for us to eat the Passover. Verse 9. Where do you want us to prepare to prepare it, they asked. He replied, as you enter the city, this kind of sounds like the triumphant entry, doesn't it? When he tells them, yeah, go find a donkey tied up and tell the guy the, the, the teacher needs it. Here we go. Uh, he replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. Did you hear that term? Let me get in the right spot again. Verse 7, came to the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Why do we call Jesus the lamb of God? He is the sacrifice. He is the sacrifice. Isn't it amazing how all this stuff fits together and how all these things tie together? And it all comes through Jesus and this amazing Word of God. Verse 14, When the hour came, Jesus and His apostles reclined at the table. And He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, He gave thanks and said, This excuse me, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. He gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 20. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. You can just see it happening, right? Imagine you're at work in the crew room, the boss comes in and said, hey man, one of you guys, one of you knuckleheads is going to sell us out, cause a big trouble, and cause a whole company to go out of business. Now that's the next, well, who is it? It ain't me, right? Nobody, oh, any teachers in the room? I'm not in trouble for that ain't comment. Uh, you get it, right? That, that, that is a very worldly and human discussion to have. Uh, I was thinking, I've shared this story before, you know, when I was in like the seventh grade, I think, we're having a film in class, and you know, back in the day, those old projectors, uh, they weren't bright enough uh, to project on the screen uh, with the lights on and the windows open. So, you know, the curtains are down, the lights are off, we're watching this uh, movie on screen. It was probably science, because Mr. Meunier was teaching, that was his job, right? He was our science teacher. He's the one that said, anyone who believes in any form of creation is stupid. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Even, well, even more so, 40 years ago, telling, making a statement like that in front of a group of students. He doesn't have enough science to support his comment. Think about it. Even today, I believe that would be a more difficult statement to get away with. I, I know that people aren't as, don't embrace our belief the way perhaps they once did, uh, but still, you just can't say that, right? Oh, that guy. Anyway, you know how it is. The lights come back on, and, and you look around, and oh my goodness, on the chalkboard, here's the screen on this end of the room, chalkboard's on this room. Somebody in great big letters had written a bad word referencing the teacher. I can just say that, right? Bad word. I'll just say there were four asterisks. Let's just say that, and, and, and the teacher's name. And he's immediately, who did that? Well, good grief. Believe it or not, this kid sitting right next to the board yells out, it wasn't me and Mansell. <laughs> I'm on the other side of the room. I'm like, I don't even know how to spell that. I don't even know what that means. That's kind of what's going on here, right? It's not me, right? It's not me. Who is it? It's not me. And here they are. Uh, by the way, I did not get blamed for that. The abomination on the chalkboard. Mr. Meunier knew better. You know I couldn't spell it wrong. <laughs> Would have started with the wrong letter. Oh, these guys. Verse 24. Also, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. This one always gets me. Who's in the room with them? Somebody tell me. Jesus. Jesus, thank you. They're in the room with Jesus, right? Turns water into wine, walks on water, calms the seas, brings the dead back to life, heals the lame, cures the leper, right? Gives sight to the blind, casts out demons, right? Son of God, and they're debating, oh man, which one of us is the best? <laughs> Why? The Jewish mother put him up to it. <laughs> Jesus, man. Jesus is the greatest. Come on, people. It, it, it's, it's like, man, you're in the room with Charles Barkley trying to figure out which one of you is the best defender in the room. Guys, it's Charles Barkley, right? Back in the day. If you don't know who he is, just substitute some modern basketball player. Don't worry about it. Here we go. He didn't play good defense <laughs> Yeah, you can chop him in the throat, though. Don't mess with him in Olympics. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exer exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Did you catch it? He says, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. 
What do the kings of the Gentiles lord over their subjects? They lord over them that they are their king, that they are in charge, that they have absolute authority over them. That's what they lord over them. Does that make sense? Some of you have worked for an employer like that at some point too, right? Then they, they just make sure you know you're less than they are. Some of you have worked with a coworker, probably that does the same thing. They just lord it over you. That they feel that they think that their skills outvalue that your skills. Here's the answer. Who cares? Do your job, right? It's all pride and ego. The bigger that ego is, the harder they fall. Oh. But you, verse 26, listen so closely. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater than the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who who is at the table, but I am among you as, listen closely, one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Verse 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you. You notice we kind of rolled into a different subject. And, and that term, is he's, as he's talking, and he says that when... You have turned back. Because Jesus knows that Peter, that Simon Peter will have a failing. He says that when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, But now, if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. He's preparing them for what is to come. He's preparing them for the next step, if you will, of this ministry. They've been walking with him physically, and he has provided everything that they needed. We struggle with that. We always get worried. Man, we're not going to have enough to eat. Uh, we're not going to have enough gas to make it where we're going. What if we have a flat tire? Well, what if you don't? Right? He provided everything they needed. We get frightened as Christians in our walk. We get frightened as a church in our, our calling to minister to our community. And, and it's the what ifs, right? And, and it's the same, that's, that's the devil. Casting doubt. Offering up temptation to do something other than what God is calling us to do. Fear, right? Fear. Fear can grip us. Fear can grip us with the unknown. And oftentimes, when we give in to that fear, we open the door for the enemy to take us in a direction that we never thought we would go. Peter, clearly, he's like, man, and, and you know it's an honest statement. He says, I'm ready to go with you. I'm ready to go to jail with you. I'm ready to die with you. Peter's the one when they came to arrest him, right? Peter's the one that got the sword out. He whacked that guy's ear off, I guess. I don't know, he was a fisherman, not a swordsman. But maybe that was just some pretty precise swords play, right? I don't know. I'm not that handy with one of those myself. I'm careful just splitting wood. I don't want to get my hand in the way, right? My dad's a professional carpenter. He's got all ten of these still. <laughs> I learned from my daddy. Watch out for those digits, right? Right.
Verse 38. The disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That is enough, he replied. The next passage is describing a time where Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives to pray. And the specific thing, I, I'm not going to read all of it because of our time. But right in the middle of it, I'll tell you the reference so you can find it. And we're in, of course, Luke 22, uh, verse 42. Jesus specifically in prayer to the Father asks, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. What's the cup? The cup that's been given to him is to be the sacrifice for the sin of all of humanity. He says, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. And immediately to follow. Not my will, but yours be done. If that is not an amazing statement of obedience. Amen. Man, I don't know what else to tell you. He, that reminds us that what is to come is ugly. That reminds us this comment alone reminds us that He knows what's coming. He knows how terrible it's going to be. He doesn't want to do it, but He's going to. I heard it described once, one of the things about being a dad is doing the things you don't want to do, but knowing you have to do it. Here's Jesus. He knows what he has to do. He doesn't really want to, but he does it anyway. Later in the scripture, it even describes that his sweat, that happens, right? You get stressed, you get nervous, you're worrying about something, you don't know what in the world to do. Uh, you're, you're, you're imagining how terrible it's going to be. And, you, know, you can start to sweat. Tension. Tension does it. You feel hot. Uh, it says that his sweat was like blood. This is as high a stress situation as you can imagine. Amen. He knows what's coming. And yet, there he stays. He knows that, the, that Judas has already sold him out, and there he stays. He knows that the priests have gathered uh, the guards, and let's call it what it is, right? A posse. And he knows uh, that they're coming after him. I don't know if they got pitchforks and torches, and you know what I mean? He knows. They're already en route by now, most likely, right? They're already en route. He knows that they know where he is. Because this was a common place for him to, re to retire to or to go to. He knows what's coming. And yet, he stays. He stays because he loves you. He stays because he is obedient to the scriptures. He stays because he knows that he is the sacrifice that can save you. He stays because he is obedient to the Father. The next scriptures that you run into, starting at verse 47, describe the arrest, continues on to the trial, to Peter disowning Jesus just as he predicted you know, if, you, if one person comes by, hey man, aren't you one of his? He's like, no. Somebody else comes, hey, don't you know Jesus? Aren't you one of his disciples? He's like, no. Someone else is all, hey man, aren't you one of the followers of Jesus? I recognize you. Uh, it says that he rebukes or turns that one away with an oath. In other words, he dropped a bad word. He said, I don't even know the man. Scripture continues to Jesus being mocked by the guards. His time before Pilate who was the Roman governor for the area, his time before Herod, who was the appointed, uh, I don't know what you call him there, for the Hebrew people. This whole process, everything, everything leading up to the cross. Crucifixion on a cross, historically I believe, is described as one of the most inhumane ways for a person to have their life taken for whatever it is they've done against society. We know that Jesus didn't do anything to the society. He did everything for the society. <coughs> Yet he was paying the price for our sins on the cross. Amen. We know as we lead into these scriptures that there were others who had been sentenced to crucifixion as well. 
It describes two, uh, one on either side of him. One of them's mocking and making fun of him. Hey, man, why don't you have some angels fly in here and fly us out? Speaking of angels, in that passage in Luke, it even talks about how an angel came and strengthened Jesus <coughs> while he was praying. Well, I guess for us. Good way to look at it, right? One guy's mocking Jesus, making fun. The other one is, man, what are you doing? This guy is innocent. He says, this guy's innocent. We deserve what we're getting. And he asked Jesus to remember him. Jesus' response to that individual, truly with this day, you will be with me, with my Father in paradise. Amen. Amen. You want to know something? I've been reading the scripture. And I cannot find a single passage that says that that guy attended Golden Valley Baptist Church in the Madeira Ranches. Do you realize that when this is taking place, our building wasn't even here yet. Now, I'm sure Bob was driving around here somewhere as in Econ is that, that uh, green and white Econoline pickup, you know. I'm teasing, come on. He was my Sunday school teacher in the sixth grade out here. Jesus is paying the price on the cross for our sin before we're even born while we're still sinners because He loves us. We start looking at this process and we look at the things that took place. It is so humbling. I'm going to tell you, it is so humbling to say, I'm a Christian. It's so humbling to even think about God's Son has forgiven my sin as a believer, as a follower of Jesus. It is humbling. We say that salvation is a free gift. It is a true statement. Please know that the sacrifice of Jesus that makes this salvation, this rescue from our sin available, came at the highest price. Amen. You can't pay a higher price than your life, right? Because after you've given your life, the possessions really don't matter. Even think about it, even his clothes. The, the, the guards are under the cross, casting lots, right? They're gambling off his clothing. <laughs> I talk about tacky, right? You read this story, you look at this life of Jesus, there are so many things that tie Jesus right back to the Old Testament prophecies. Time and time and time again. And some of it's small. Even the casting of lots for his clothing. It's, some of it, it's so tiny, but it's like, oh my goodness. There it is. Jesus, God's Son. Think about this time that he shared with the disciples in the upper room. They're lounging in there, just hanging out, having fun. You've been there, right? Enjoying a dinner with some friends. and uh, I don't know, it might have been a big yummy fajita burrito for me, but that's a different story. You've been there, though. The conversation and the stuff that takes place and the fellowship. And there they are as he's describing, as he's breaking the bread and talking about, this is my body given for you. As he's sharing the cup with them. This represents my blood, my blood of the new covenant poured out for you. Even the one who's going to betray him is present. He ducks out and, and goes to, because he knows what's next. You know, Judas ducks out. But you think about Jesus. Man, what an ideal model for us to pattern ourselves after. With this love that is so available with this forgiveness that is so available this obedience that is modeled so perfectly and there he is a gentleman and it says right like he stands at the door and knocks he waits he waits for each individual to choose to say yes to Him. Sadly, by choosing not to say yes, folks say no. That's the reality. 
Life's not fair, but it's a choice. We have a choice to ask God's Son, Jesus, into our heart, into our life, to ask Him into our life and forgive our sins, sin and be our Lord. It's a choice. Each person will have an opportunity to say yes or no. Church, we serve a great God. He is at work all around us. He is working miracles, changing lives, providing. His word is good. It is accurate. His son, Jesus, is amazing and wonderful. You just have to figure out what, he, what you're going to let him do through you. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, you are so awesome. I can't imagine what it would be like to be in the garden, knowing that they're coming, knowing that you could flee, and yet standing that ground, staying, and allow others to take the control. I can't imagine what it would be like to feel the pain that you experienced for my sin. I cannot imagine the hurt that you must have felt when the cry, crowd cried out, give us Barabbas. When the crowd shouted about Jesus to crucify him. I cannot imagine that. At the same time, I am thankful that you, Jesus, paid the price that I that we cannot afford to pay. I'm thankful that we can call in your name as Lord and Savior. I'm thankful that you answer every prayer. I'm thankful that you have power over the enemy, over Satan. That you have power over sin. I'm thankful that through you, forgiveness is available and eternity with you in heaven is the promise. In your name we pray these things. Amen. As our musicians have come forward, this is a time of invitation. You are invited to come forward and share whatever decision it is God has placed on your heart. It could be that you're here this morning and for the first time you're recognizing and hearing the truth of Jesus in that He paid the price for your sin because He loves you. It could be for the first time you're hearing that He wants to have a personal relationship with you. Today might be that day for the first time you might want to honestly say, I'm a sinner. I want to ask Jesus into my heart that He would forgive my sin and be my Lord. It could be the decision that God is putting on your heart today as a new believer. Uh, it could be you've been praying and struggling and thinking about baptism. It could be that it's like, man, I know Jesus is Lord of my life. It's time to make a public profession in the water and out that I have died to sin and I'm reborn a new creation in Jesus Christ. Part of that, that, that baptism too is, man, isn't it a statement? It's a statement. I am not ashamed of my Savior, Jesus. It could be you're here this morning and uh, maybe it's uh, church membership. I don't know the decision, but, but you and Jesus know it. it. could be you're here today as a believer and you're thinking like, man, I'm a little far off of center. I've lost sight of the cross. I've lost sight of that empty tomb. I've lost sight of those nail-scarred hands. And it's not because Jesus left you. It's because we, because I, have chosen to be disobedient. As a Christian, we rededicate our life. Again, not because Jesus has left us, but because He has revealed to us that we have chosen to go somewhere that He didn't want us to go to. And thankfully, that nail-scarred hand, I always put this one out because it's got a good nail scar across it. It's nothing compared to His, by the way. Thankfully, that nail-scarred hand is always there, reaching out, ready to bring you back into that close relationship. I'll tell you the truth. 
it's easy to come to a place in our walk as a Christian where we feel we can no longer serve Him. We feel that we're no longer useful. Well, here's the reality. It's about our choice. And it's the enemy that distracts us from the truth of Christ. And if you make yourself available, he can and will restore you. He restored Peter, right? He can and will restore you. Make yourself available. Could be you're here this morning, and man, it's just, you need to come up to the altar and lift up a prayer to God. It could be a praise. It could be a help me with this. Uh, it could just be, man, God, you're amazing. Thank you for my salvation. Help me to be your voice in this dark world. Those of you joining us later online can participate through comments and private message, and we'll follow up with that. And of course, folks, you know we can pray no matter where we are. Please stand as we lead into this invitation.